Okay. So we are in conversation with uh, Mr. Don Gardner. He is the principal of PD Somani International School. And uh, today, thank you for meeting us, Mr. Gardner, firstly. And um, some of the questions we have with you is that you represent one of the best, finest institutions which bring international education down to India. And uh, you have worked previously abroad as well. What are some of the challenges that you feel that this international education in India is going to have? And what are some of the opportunities? Okay, well, I think the, you know, when I first arrived here, very clearly the biggest challenge was finding suitable teachers to deliver the program in a, in a school like this. Because um, let's say there's a tradition in education in India uh, whereby teachers are trained to teach in a style which puts too much emphasis on content and information uh, rather than developing skills and developing in particular the idea to be a critical thinker. And that's a big paradigm shift for people who've been in education for a long time here to see uh, the job of a teacher as being somebody to get the students to think as opposed to being somebody who has a lot of information that they have to impart. So I think that was the, you know, probably the biggest challenge at the beginning and you know, in the six years that I've been here I think we've you know, done quite a bit to overcome that because I, 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 you know, I mean, we've got teachers here in this school now who've been here for four or five years and have uh, taken the risk to develop a, a different style of teaching. So when you say that they developed a different style of teaching, uh, was it something that was done through formal training or was it a vision that you set in the beginning? What was most effective in getting the teachers to change? Well, it's a combination of both. Because we offer the International Baccalaureate Diploma Program here in the IGCSE, we can send our teachers on short workshops organised by Cambridge International and by the IB itself. So th those things are helpful. But there's been a lot of uh, input from myself and other experienced uh, teachers, either expats or you know, from within India, who have made an input uh, uh, gradually uh, in uh, helping teachers to see different ways of um, operating in the classroom. What advice would you give to teachers who don't have access to such support from their institutions but would still like to, you know, internationalize the way they teach their students? Could they do some sort of self-study, self-research? Well, I mean, I, I don't know whether what I'm going to say is how accurate it is, but I'm quite... Um, uh, let's say encouraged by one or two teachers that I've recruited into this school directly from teachers colleges here in Mumbai who seem to have got uh, let's say a much more um, interactive uh, style of teaching so somebody must be doing some good things maybe now with the new teachers that are coming through as opposed to perhaps what was being done 10, 20 years ago. So, you know, clearly the message is getting through that we need a different style of teaching, uh, you know, for, for Indian kids. Um, another interesting concept that you have out here is that uh, GD Somali is right next door, uh, and, you know, they, therefore in the Indian uh, curricula, per se, the Indian Board of Education. Any things that you think that can you know transpire from there over here? Some things that you'd like to take from there that maybe the international system could you know benefit. Well, I won't mention, I won't comment on GD Smiley specifically, but we we have a big input of intake of students coming into our eleventh grade because of the Mumbai setup. Where we we'll just close the door. Because of the Mumbai setup where most schools finish 10th grade, so
So kids can either then go from 10th grade to a junior college or they can come to a school like ours or perhaps go to a cathedral. Um, so we take quite a large number of students in at the beginning of 11th grade. And even though they've been in, let's say, what I've described as a more traditional uh, type of school, what's, um, you know, what's, what's good about these students is that in those more traditional types of schools, they've learned very good work habits. So for instance, I think in the, in the Indian system, there's a lot of pressure to um, study and learn the portion you know, the textbook, the syllabus, and kids are, have been trained to be good memorizers. So they work very hard. So they bring that to our school. Because of course, even though our programs are very different, you still can't be a good student if you can't work hard. And it's still, even within our system, necessary, you know, to be able to remember certain things. We, we, have, we have to get our students to do more than that, think for themselves. But what I would say is that it's clear that Indian kids um, come from uh, an educational tradition where hard work and commitment uh, to study is very, very strong. What, what would you say um I, you yourself have been have taught you know world over. What would you say are some of the tri tricks and tips? Something that teachers can use in any classroom, wherever they are. Some things that you feel are important, or some things that are unique to your teaching style, which you think others can. Take oh from. boy, <laughs> that's a difficult question. Um, I think you know really for me anyway, and this is a personal response to what you've asked. I think it's extremely important to find ways to like all the students. You have to like them. You know, I mean, being a teacher, interacting with students is like any human interaction. You know, if I send out signals to you that I don't really like you, uh, then you're not going to want to cooperate with me, you're not going to want to, you know, please me, you're not going to want to accept any challenge I give you and so I think the starting point for any teacher is to find what's good about every student and to you know establish a relationship where the student you know thinks well this teacher likes me this teacher is kind of like, you know being fair with me and once you've established that then most young people you know are eager to learn things and to uh, improve themselves and to uh, develop their skills so I think that it, it, teaching is a you know very much about an interpersonal relationship between the teacher and the student and, and that you, you have to make sure that that's you know firmly uh, established before, before you can do very many worthwhile things True. So it's all about the interpersonal uh, skills out well, there. It's not all about it. I mean, yeah. once you've got the interpersonal skills established, you certainly have to have something to say. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and I say to all of my teachers here, you know, that a te teaching is a lot about entertainment. <laughs> you, know, you, you, you have to know what you want the students to learn, but you have to be able to deliver it in an entertaining way. I mean, if it, you know, you think about it, a teacher's job is to be in, in front of a group of people, you know, whatever numbers there are, whether they're 20 or 40, uh, maybe five, six times a day. And they, if in a high school, they're, they're different groups of people. So uh, you can't bore them. So how do you avoid boring them? You've got to be entertaining. So if you don't see the role as being that of an entertainer, then you're going to be always climbing up a hill, I think. So the role of an entertainer, so that's, it's, it's moving from a guide to a, a, a friend and an entertainer, right? Is, is that? Well, I mean, you know, that's what makes the job so exciting because it's a combination of all of these sorts of skills. What role do you think technology is going to play right now? We are seeing schools that are becoming tablet only, or the one laptop per child project is trying to get laptops where you know technology was not there before. 
How do you see it affecting our current education system? Is it just a distraction or is it something that's going to be essential in the classroom? Well, I think it's, you know, for me, technology is like anything else that uh, is there that can be used to improve, you know, the, the role of the teacher. So that the teacher, is, it, it can help the teacher to make the class entertaining. If it, if it you know, if it adds variety uh, and, you know, an input that the teacher or the textbook or the whiteboard can't give. I mean, we've introduced this year uh, a very interesting new development at our school. We are offering uh, two IB courses to our students online, which means that the students will have trained IB teachers from outside of India teaching the whole course to them and they will have to interact with the te teachers um, through a variety of ele electronic uh, methods. Now that's a, a really interesting development for us. It, it enables students to study, for instance, one of the subjects we're offering is Mandarin. So this is an important language for Indians to learn. We, you know, we probably can't find a Mandarin teacher here in Mumbai. So we've got students who can now study Mandarin online through this IB approved uh, organisation. Not only will they be learning Mandarin, but they'll be learning some very, very important uh, skills about how technology, the internet, can work in this sort of, um, you know, that, that, in, that, in that sort of way. You know, some people have taken this to the extreme and are saying that the school of tomorrow is just going to be computer because you have the resources, you have the, you know, the learning material online, and the student knows how to navigate that. What, do you think that's even possible? Do you think the schools, the brick motor school will still have a role to play? Well, what will people like me do if that happens? <laughs> you know, I think it, you know, it, it's probably a little bit like, um, you know, I think we have, have to have a mixture. It's a little bit like, you know, now that we've got 2020 and IPL, does this, does this mean the end of test matches? Hopefully not. You know, hopefully there's a place for both and hopefully, uh, you know, if test match cricketers play in the IPL, they, get, they become better test match cricketers and vice versa. And I think that, you know, the day that the human interaction, you know, the flesh, flesh and blood teacher in the classroom, um, you know, interacting with the student, the day that that disappears, then, you know, we're, we're going to, uh, will be a sad day. Because we have to remember that education is about more than just learning academics. It's about you know, learning how to become an adult. That's part of the role of a school, to help young people learn all of the skills that are necessary for them in their future. You, so you are now an administrator. A principal in India is always you know, battling both these roles of you know, academic and administrator. And we were just discussing before this about your open door policy. What other things do you think education administrators can do in India to, you know, have this continuous learning process among the teachers as well as, you know, be friendly and, you know, make it a student friendly environment as well? Not quite following your question. Um, as an administrator, what are some of the ideas that you, as an education administrator, what are some of the ideas you think which could, uh, you know, which could be effective with the Indian environment? Well, at the school level, you know, I'm very, very clear about this, and that is that we have to do something about the rampant tuition classes that, you know, um, carry on here. You know, and I, I very strongly say to my teachers, I say it to parents, I say it to students, that we should be seeking to establish a school where there isn't a single student uh, uh, who feels that they have to go and take extra classes after school. So the school has to try and you know, meet the needs of the students. So you can see here in India, the, the, there's this notion that, you know, 
after a full day at school, you then need so many hours sitting with somebody else to teach you the things that you should have learned at school. Yeah. I think it's terrible because after school, students should be doing other things. They should be learning to play the guitar, they should be playing a sport, they should be reading books, they should be um, you know, participating in some drama activities. Or they should be even just trying to develop their knowledge of what they've learnt at school during the day. So, I, you know, for me, I think you know that that that's one area where we really need to uh, do something. Yeah. Yeah. You want to talk about the right to education? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You must have heard about the recent Right to Education Act that they yeah. passed. Uh, how do you think that will affect the system, the education system? See. If you were going to ask me a much bigger question about India, and I know India quite well, not as well as you do probably, but I first came here in 1996, and after that I came here two, three times a year on holidays before I moved here in 2006. So I've got a knowledge of India since, uh, how long is that? That's over 15 years, yeah? You ask me what's the biggest problem in India, I don't think it's poverty, uh, I don't think it's a lack of infrastructure, I think it's the, the, you know, the, the problems within education. There's not enough money being spent on it, uh, there's not enough, uh, let's say, um, willpower at the top to improve education. So when you talk about the right to education, what actually is required in India is you know money to be spent to build better schools to train more teachers to pay teachers more money and for there to be a much greater focus on uh, school education right throughout India I mean for the moment India has this that fantastic advantage of having you know, you know, in, in a country with such a big population, so many people are at the bottom end of the age group. So you've got, you know, a, a, a big percentage of your population um, under 20, compared to a country like China, where because of their one-child policy, there's there's much fewer really young people. So there's a tremendous advantage in India that you know, in terms of you know. Uh, a workforce available there, but it's an uneducated workforce. And there must be masses of potential that's being wasted because these people are not being educated properly. And, and that's sad. But when we talk about this potential, uh, do you think that is the problem only with the government or is it a problem with the culture or with the student? Where, where do we see that? Or is it just because we're not spending enough? I'm not a politician. <laughs> <laughs> I honestly don't know. But when I look around, I think, you know, I, I meet, you know, there, there's, I mean, I remember when I used to go walking in Calabar Woods early in the morning, at five o'clock in the morning, when it's still dark, seeing some of the slum children sitting under the street, street lamp to read their books. You know, so, you know, there's a keenness to learn. When my students go off to the fishermen's colony to teach the little kids English, or when they go to a village school out in the rural areas to do some uh, teaching, they always come back and they always say, God, these kids are so eager to learn. They're eager to learn, they need teachers, they need the books, they need the school infrastructure. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Gardner. It was a wonderful talk. I think our teachers at 99 uh, will take away a lot from this interaction of ours. And thank you for spending time with us.